Good morning. Wow, what a morning. I'm not from Minnesota. I flew in last night from Washington, D.C. and have just been schooled in uh, how a state and so many leaders from the nonprofit, public, private sector can really tackle a complex issue. And I got to say, in a not just Minnesota nice way, but a Minnesota smart way, I'm really um, uh, humbled to be here. I have been asked to come and talk about movements and um, how change happens. As Tom mentioned, I was invited here actually um, at the introduction of Audrey Sucre. Where's Audrey from Serve Minnesota? Um, he, Audrey attended a executive training program at Georgetown that we offer called New Strategies. It helps nonprofit leaders figure out how to diversify their revenue streams. But we connected around this issue because the research for how change happens really came out of my first book, Forces for Good high impact nonprofits and what makes them great. And we realized that the most successful nonprofits from that first study build movements. They don't just shore up their capacity, try and add you know, more beds or more programs or services. How do you get to the systems change? And you guys are all here with one hand on a piece of the elephant of how you solve this incredibly complex problem where there is not one easy answer to the opioid addiction. I also wanted to say that I come here from Georgetown, but also from a personal perspective, since so many of the speakers here have spoken passionately about theirs as, as a mother, as a family member. Uh, my husband's an ER doc, and every night when he comes home from the night shifts and talks about the fentanyl cases that come in and why he didn't make it home that night to see the kids. We see it, I see it there. I see it from a family member who struggles with addiction, right now over the last five years and impacts every family gathering that we have. I see it from my father who's been in the hospital for 57 days with multi-organ failure. He survived, but he took Dilaterol, probably one of the highest concentration opioids you can get. And thank God, because I've never seen my father cry or be in so much pain. <laughs> now he survived. So I, I see all these different perspectives. I have three kids. I have two middle schoolers. Think about this every day. What's going to happen to them in the Montgomery County Public Schools in Maryland, where, where I live? So, so I bring you know, my own individual perspective um, and empathy to all the different sides of the issue. Um, I also had planned to come in here um, with a little bit of lightness. This is such a serious issue. But I was thinking, being invited to come to a campus you know, I work at a college, coming to the University of Minnesota. The host of this event kindly put me up at this really interesting hotel, The Graduate, down the street here. <laughs> Very funky. There's a lot of students hanging out in their plaid pajamas with their laptops uh, last night. And um, <laughs> I started thinking for my eighth grade daughter, you know, we, we were already talking about, where might Kaylee go to college? You know, I don't think she'll want to stay home at Georgetown. Would she come here? And we're having a funny conversation around the dinner table recently, I have a, an eighth grader, a sixth grader, and a first grader. And, and we we're saying, well, wherever Kaylee goes to college, you know, we're really going to miss her. We really miss Kaylee. And my first grader said, yeah, I'm really going to miss Kaylee when she goes away to college, too. Mom, what's college? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, um, th this is where my head is at many days as well. Um, so delighted to be here on a college campus talking about a, a, such a serious issue, and I'm going to put it, frame it in a much broader context of, you know, you're, you're in the midst of this crisis. We've all got a hands on an elephant, but we also um, are part of movements. And what we're going to do is step back from this particular issue around the opioid epidemic, opioid crisis, and talk about how many other crises, many other major social problems and environmental problems that we've confronted <coughs> in our lifetimes in this country have been solved, and the movements and campaigns behind them. And then we're going to bring it back this afternoon for those that are staying after lunch to think about how some of these practices and principles can be applied right here in the state of Minnesota, but also nationally. Because this is a conversation that Georgetown wants to be involved in um, for the long haul, not just for today, October 2nd, here in Minnesota. So 
Let me start with just talking about how much movements matter. And I believe they matter today as much as they ever have. Um, you know, it was the populist movement that elected Donald Trump that is also the anvil against which so many other movements are rising today. I come out of the swamp, you know, we're in the midst of this reckoning with the Me Too movement. And, you know, um, I can't help but listen and think about the testimony that's been given, you know, in the Senate in the last couple of weeks and think about in this room, talking about addictions, having somebody talk about how much they like beer. I don't know how that resonates out here in uh, Minnesota. Um, you know, it's strange times that we're in. Um, You've got really successful movements, um, whether you're part of the Tea Party or the populist movement that's behind Donald Trump, or you're part of the liberal and progressive side. You know, the movements that we studied in this book, what we really wanted to understand was, why do some succeed and others not? Regardless of which side of the issue you're on or which part of the political spectrum that you happen to reside on. Um, the question behind our researchers was, why some movements succeed and others fizzle out. And we looked at an incredible array of changes that have happened, again, in our lifetimes. Take the issue of tobacco, one of the panelists, uh, and that we had some commentary around that. How did we go from this, a time in the US when you know, many Americans smoked, at one point maybe one in two men, if this was just a couple decades ago in this room, a third to half of you could have been holding a cigarette. And by the way, it would have been legal uh, to be doing that. We know that doctors and nurses smoked in hospitals, that smoked at bedsides. You know, not only that, smoking was popular, right? It was fashionable and frequent, socially accepted. So how did we go from that to this, right? A time when um, smoking is banned from most public places. Uh, office buildings, college park, even casinos um, and bars moving in this direction, right? But not only is it banned and taxed, obviously um, the, one of your legislators talked about the price of a carton of cigarettes today being so out of reach. You know, those taxes were the result of the advocacy and the movement that put excise taxes in place so that originally you could put cigarettes out of the hands, out of the reach of young people that were strapped for cash and ultimately other smokers. But probably as powerful as those legislative policy and the litigated um, strategies as well, of course, the attorneys general suits that led to the uh, global settlement agreement that uh, funded a lot of the, um, the windfalls that were discussed. As important as the litigation was and the lobbying and the advocacy at the grassroots level, there was a deliberate and concentrated effort to switch that social norm because tobacco control activists realized that the enemy wasn't just this addictive substance. You know, it was the industry. It was companies that had created these beloved brands. It was the Marlboro Man. It was Joe Camel. And they realized they had to attack that norm and the popularity and the enticement and the sexiness, the sex appeal of smoking, along with the legislative and litigative strategy. And what we're going to talk about today is the tactics, the strategies, how they went about doing that, and how that was funded, and why that was such a big part of their success in the overall campaign. Another issue that we looked at, marriage equality. How did we go from a time in this country just 15 years ago? We had uh, DOMA. We had 11 states with ballot referendums underway to ban marriage between um, uh, same-sex couples. How do we go from that to a time today when now marriage equality, as we know, for LGBT couples is the law of the land? Um, dramatic shift, years and decades of activism and advocacy behind this tip. But what led to that tipping point right now? Another issue we looked at, guns. How is it with the phenomenal success of the gun rights movement that we've seen in the last couple decades, how is it that the NRA, the predominant advocacy organization behind gun rights, moved from this 150-year-old organization founded as a charitable organization, a sportsman's group to teach hunting and shooting safety and these kinds of things. How did the NRA transform since the 70s into this, the most powerful lobbying membership group in our country that has uh, changed state, national, federal laws 
making this the most open uh, and um, accepting nation on earth to gun ownership and access. Why has the gun rights movement been so successful in the last few decades? And my other question was, and why, on the other hand, has gun control been relatively weak in the last couple of decades? And I should say that I only looked at changes that have happened in our lifetime since the turn of the 21st century, because I wanted to understand how movements succeed or die in the current political, economic, cultural context, right? Now, this is a list of all of the different changes that we explored in the research. I'm not going to talk about all of them today in depth, but on the black side of the screen are changes that have happened since the 1990s. And on the red side, changes that are either in progress or maybe just emerging, right? So you know, how is it that in the environmental realm, we had a huge problem with acid rain in North America. Maybe your um, car paint jobs were peeling, and we saw the effects of that with the lakes and um, the dearth of uh, na nature and wildlife. How, how did we solve acid rain, but we're kind of stuck on carbon and climate action now? Um, how did we cut drunk driving rates in half um, since the founding of Mothers Against Drunk Driving? Um, we talked about gun rights expansion. Um, extension of justice and equality to LGBT marriage um, proponents. Um, these, all these issues. And then, you know, at the other extreme, you know, we have an opioid epidemic. We've had an obesity epidemic growing for years in this country. It's getting worse. Young people and adults, higher rates of obesity. I had to flatten line for a little. We just had an obesity forum um, at Georgetown yesterday where we brought together cross-sector leaders trying to tackle this um, enormous problem. So, so some changes have happened, some changes happened, have not happened. And by the way, you know, here in Minnesota, maybe people in this room really like some of these changes that happened. And maybe you really don't, but it doesn't really matter and we're not going to talk about what side you're on. All we're going to talk about today is how they happened and what you can draw from those lessons to tackle this opioid crisis that we're all struggling with today. So the six practices of high impact successful movements, um, noticing it's a little hard to see that under the um, lights here, but we're going to talk about the factors that differentiated those winning movements from the less successful movements. And the first one I'm going to talk about is how winning movements turn their grassroots gold. This is the first chapter in the book because it is the most important and most differentiating factor when I looked at movements that have soared and those that have fizzled out. The ones that figured out how to tap in, expand, and catalyze their grassroots always won. Let's talk about guns, most important issue. So let's talk about the grassroots of the gun rights movement. And I'll put you in a point in time, 2012. 2012 was the year of the Newton massacre, the Sandy Hook school shooting when 26 elementary school students and educators were mowed down by a mass shooter. At that point in time, the NRA had built up its grassroots membership to about 5 million members. At that same point in time, the Brady campaign, the largest gun control group that existed until then, had around 400,000 members. It wasn't even set up as a membership organization. It had about 400,000 supporters. Since the NRA had started to focus on and build up its grassroots in the 1990s, during that, let's call it now, 20 to 30 year span, the gun control movement was one-tenth the size of the gun rights movement. Now, that might not be apparent to you if you're not a gun owner or you're not a member of some of the gun control groups because because of the liberal media bias, but also because the overwhelming majority of public opinion says they want tighter gun laws. And yet, in many states and many places, the policies reflect what the grassroots membership of the gun rights movement wants. Now, this balance has begun to change um, after that. Oh, my battery's running low. Can somebody help me? Recharge. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, 
so every town for gun safety is actually was created in 2014 uh, as a merger between Shannon Watts, who started something called Moms Demand Action. She's a mom, stay-at-home mom of four kids in Indiana. Right after the Sandy Hook school shooting, she was incensed. She grew up in Colorado. She wasn't a Columbine survivor, but certainly those of us coming up in the 80s, you know, were, were, were part of that first wave. So she said, we've got to do something to stop this. Started Moms Demand Action. Grew it till, and by 2017 to be um, about 4 million supporters when it merged up with Mayor Bloomberg's Mayors Against Illegal Guns. Then, thank you so much. Um, it's not letting me advance. Do you mind closing that box too? Thank you. All right, so, and then of course, since Valentine's Day of this year, with the Parkland shooting, um, and with the new wave of youth activism coming behind the gun safety side, uh, now every town's membership has grown to more than five million members. So, for the first time in about three decades, at a grassroots level, the gun control movement is of an equal and opposite volume and intensity to the gun rights movement. Now, I'm not making any predictions about which way things will run, but I do know this, that the absence of this organized and strategically mobilized grassroots is a big reason, if not the single reason, why the gun rights cause, and for those of you that might support it, have been so successful. Let's look at another issue, tobacco control. You know, a lot of people talk about movements and money. Well, maybe the gun rights movement was so successful because it's got the gun lobby behind it. Well, the tobacco industry dwarfs the gun industry in annual revenues, and it did much more so billions you know, at, at, at its height. And yet, in the case of tobacco, we get this opposite outcome. It was the grassroots tobacco control advocates that won the day and um, didn't completely defeat, but were able to really undercut the tobacco industry. So why is that? Well, it's because of the grassroots. It's the way that the grassroots organizations and activists were organized on the tobacco control side, right? So um, one of the speakers asked, you know, why, why did that, that happen? Well, you had decades of tobacco control activism, but right after, uh, in the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, you saw um, the, the campaign for tobacco-free kids launched with seed funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Now, the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids is not one single 501c3 organization, but really a coalition. American Heart, Lung, Cancer, these big health voluntaries with millions of grassroots members all coming to the realization if they really want to have an impact on cancer, on lung disease, on these diseases, as we're searching and struggling to find cures, obviously the single biggest way is to prevent the disease from occurring in the, per in, in the first place. By the way, the tobacco control movement, I would argue, is the single biggest, most positive social change if you want to look at lives saved and disease and suffering prevented. No single movement has succeeded more than the tobacco control movement. Again, wh whatever side of that issue that you're on. Another reason why it's been so successful started right here in Minnesota. You know, you were the ground zero for some of the first smoking bans. Then, of course, Arizona, um, cities in Arizona, then Berkeley, and Americans for Non-Smokers' Rights emerged out of a Californians for Non-Smokers' Rights group. So it was non-smokers saying, we believe the science out there. You know, it was Surgeon General was telling us since 1964 that smoking was dangerous and could cause cancer. People weren't really listening or changing their behavior until non-smokers' rights groups, Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, all these big grassroots groups came together in nationally coordinated but locally focused ways to tackle that issue. And by contrast, the tobacco industry, while it was powerful, I mean, if you think about it, you know, not just powerful in terms of money, but all the tobacco-growing states, the legislators, they paid the lobbyist. They owned all the advertising firms up on Madison Avenue, right? They created Marlboro Man and Camel. So they had a lot of power of influence, but they did not have grassroots local big membership. And so that's why the tail, the, I, um, in our analysis, the scales tipped in the other direction in the case of tobacco. Another example, just to throw, 
throw it into the mix. When you look at polio, we're 99.9% .9 close to eradicating polio from the face of the earth. Um, you know, maybe a dozen cases documented in the wild. Why is that? Well, if you ask the average person, they might say, well, maybe it's Bill Gates pouring billions into his global health initiatives, right, or WHO. When, when you interview people involved in this movement, to a one, they'll tell you it's Rotary International with its 33,000 chapters all around the world, its millions of members who had the boots on the ground. They built the political and social will to make polio a thing of the past in every country on the face of the earth. You know, I had this interview with um, Bruce Aylward, the intrepid uh, head of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative for many years. And he said, Bill Gates and I would never take a meeting anywhere in the world without a Rotarian by our side. Every parliament, every government has a Rotarian, you know, in communities in Africa, in Latin America, in Asia, all around, you know, they have the credibility and the gravitas in their local communities. And they could open up those doors and help bring, open up the state and local resources to put polio eradication at the top of the priority list for many of these countries that have many other, other urgent, urgent needs. So again, you know, no matter what the cause or the issue, we saw that when you have these big grassroots networks with boots on the ground advocating for your cause, working in a centrally coordinated way, you stand a really good chance of winning your movement. All right, let's talk about the next practice that emerged in our research. Um, it's a tongue twister. We call it sharpen your 10, 10, 10, 20 equals 50 vision. And, um, this comes straight out of the playbook of the marriage equality movement. And this rubric really came about um, in a meeting, probably a lot like this, but in a conference room uh, in a building in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, and this is when the first seeds of how marriage equality was won really started to be planted. So I'll take you back to that time. It was um, 15 years ago, it was 2000 and sorry, 13 years ago, 2005, there was this meeting and many of the leaders in the marriage equality movement had come together. It was a really dark time if you were an LGBT advocate. Um, as I mentioned, President Clinton had signed DOMA, so um, the Defense of Marriage Act de defined marriage as only between a man and a woman. 13 states had ballot referendums underway to ban it. The only place in America at that point in time where it was legal to be married was Massachusetts. Massachusetts had just passed its um, marriage law, but there was a, a really vociferous backlash underway led by Mitt Romney, leaders of the Catholic Church. And so they were on the ropes. And Evan Wilson, the founder of Freedom to Marry, Matt Coles from ACLU, Mary Bonato, who argued the case in front of the Supreme Court, um, so many leaders had gotten together uh, they actually were convened at the invitation of Tim Gill, a mega donor involved in this issue uh, based out of Colorado. And they said, what are we, what are we gonna do? You know, we're, at that moment, marriage equality did not look inevitable the way we talk about it today. It, it looked impossible. So, so at, that, at that dark hour, they said, okay, we can't, you know, it looks like we're failing, but what can we do? What if we looked at the country and we split it up by region, and we said, let's take 10 states and actually just try and go for full marriage. We'll defend it in Massachusetts, we'll go to New York where there's a lot you know, more progressives and liberals, we might be able to catch fire there. And they said, okay, but let's also take 10 states and we'll just go for civil unions, right? That was something, uh, a new construct came out of Vermont, separate, kind of unequal, but better than what we've got, right? Um, so then they said, we'll take 10 states and we'll just try and get domestic partnership recognition laws on the books. And then we'll take the balance of the states, half of the country, and all we'll try and do is take discriminatory laws off the books. So sodomy laws or, you know, the, so what the idea was, how do we take the whole country and take one incremental step forward towards tolerance, wherever you were starting from, right? And that's when change really started to happen by having this very tailored approach. And when we looked at all of these other movements, we saw the same approach. They didn't call it that necessarily, right? Um, when you look at drunk driving reduction, 
you know, when Mothers Against Drunk Driving was first started by Candy Leitner, started in California, then she, they moved it to Texas uh, pretty early on. Uh, Candy Leitner has this great quote in my book. She says, my advice to any movement leader, any nonprofit leader is if you want to win, never open an office in Washington, DC. <laughs> you know, it's all about the chapters. It's all about decentralized state and local action, pushing power out to local leaders working on books in their cities, in their towns, in their states to push it forward. Tobacco control, same thing. You know, I talked about the campaign for tobacco-free kids, that national group uh, based in DC. And I should say, um, truth in advertising, the founding president of Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids, Bill Novelli, is my boss at uh, Georgetown. He founded the institute, the in initiative that I'm the executive director of. Uh, after that, he went on to be the CEO of AARP for many years, has a lot of lobbying and advocacy knowledge uh, before joining the faculty at Georgetown. Um, tobacco control. So Robert Wood Johnson Foundation poured about three quarters of a billion dollars into the tobacco control movement over a 10-year period, starting in 1995. A little bit of that went to the national campaign. The biggest chunk, over a quarter of a billion dollars, went to 40 state and based local coalitions. They called them the RWJ, Smokeless States Coalitions. Grassroots groups, probably some of you and your organizations were part of them, advocating for those excise taxes, uh, trying to get smoking bans and so forth passed at the state and local level. It's one of the biggest differences, again, when you look at some of the less successful movements, when movement leaders direct their funding to big national groups rather than spread it into the local and grassroots, it tends to get the opposite effect. You might think it might be dilutive, but in fact, it was very empowering. Gun rights, let's talk about gun rights. Have you ever wondered why there's never been a big gun rights march on Capitol Hill? I have, because I've been to a lot of gun control marches. They don't march on Capitol Hill, because they know that's not how change happens. As President Obama says, change comes to Washington, not from Washington. They march on the state capitals. They work at the state and local level, passing preemption laws in the vast majority of US states to make laws so that local towns and cities, for instance, can't pass anything that might be more restrictive than what already exists at the state level. Very, very savvy approach. Put their resources, time, energy into it. When I, when I, when I talk to activists across a range of spectrum um, on these issues, you know, today, in this post-Parkland moment, we, we see a lot of First Amendment right action, right? People exercising their freedom of speech. And we see a lot of Second Amendment activism to obey and defend this amendment that many people adhere to. But I tell you that it is the Tenth Amendment to the US Constitution that will direct the way the policy pendulum is going to swing next. Because the Tenth Amendment pushes all or most of the powers out to you, the states, and reserves a very few to the feds. So the movements that figure out how to tap into that Tenth Amendment construct and treat us as a federation, not a one monolithic 50 people who all agree and all think the same way, but in fact take it down to the state level, you're going to win. Now, I also think this also applies. You can scale it up with polio. You know, Rotary became uh, the venue through which they went country by country. But here in Minnesota, as you think down to your, your counties, and your local municipalities, how do you tailor your approaches, whether it's opioids or whatever the issue is, so that you can get everybody moving maybe one step in the right direction? All right, let's talk about this next practice. Um, great movements change hearts, not just policy, right? Like I talked about before, tobacco control is probably the master of this, of, of all the movements that we studied, because they realized, you know, again, we're. We're taking on Philip Morris, Joe Camel. There was a point at the uh, start of the modern tobacco control movement when Joe Camel uh, polls were done, had more name recognition than Santa Claus <laughs> among children in poor communities. That's how well marketed these things are, right? So, so they realized we've, we're up against these brands, these iconic, we, we identified with our brands. I mean, I smoke Marlboro Lights, you know, sorry, my mom's not here. Uh, <laughs> you know, like we, you identified with your brands, right? It was a part of our identity. So how, how did they take on shifting this norm while also changing policies, regulations, uh, accessibility, and all these things? So I'm gonna look at a 
One video from the modern um, truth campaign just to kind of give a taste of why tobacco control has been so successful. Whoops. All right, let me see if I can get this going. What's great about that, that ad? <laughs> You're laughing, so it's funny. Uh, what else? What do you notice about this campaign? It reveals the unknown. Who knew that pets are dying from smoke? It reveals the unknown. OK, you didn't know that pets, uh, secondhand smoke can cause cancer in pets. Yep. Why do you think this has gone viral with millions and millions of views among teens and tweens? Next, late stage millennials and next gen in our country on YouTube. iPhones. Pardon? Everyone's on their iPhone. iPhones. You you got pets. Smoking rates are down to under six percent for youth and fifteen percent adults nationally. But we've been telling young people not to smoke; it's bad for you for a very long time. Why did this ad work? Exactly. It wasn't about, does it say don't smoke? No. Does it say smoking's bad for you? No. It says smoking's bad for something you care a lot about. And more importantly, not only would you not have pets, but you wouldn't have stupid pet videos. <laughs> and that's what my 11-year-old son turned me on to this ad. I, we were driving in the car one day a couple summers ago, and I was starting research for my book. And, they asked, what was this book about? And I said, it's about changes and how everybody used to smoke, but nobody smokes anymore. And my then, um, I guess he was 10 at the time, son Quinn said, well, of course nobody smokes. Smoking's really bad for you. It's like that cat video, mom. And I was like, <laughs> what cat video? And he was like, oh my god, it's had like millions of views. It says smoking's really bad. It causes cancer in pets. Who would ever smoke, right? Like, it, it worked. Uh, uh, so, so then, of course, when we got home, we had to jump online and, and my son spent some time on YouTube. Um, uh, Fortnite, too, I have to admit. Um, so um, it, so we, we searched it up, and we found that. And, and then we had to watch it like 10 times. Then we started searching for other stupid pet videos. And then I said, you know, I'm doing research for my book. So I'm curious, what's out there? I just typed in gun control to see what came up. And then this ad came up in our feed. We're millions of average, honest Americans. We're moms and dads who want to live in safe neighborhoods and send our kids to safe schools. We're Republicans, Democrats, Independents, and none of the above. We're every color, creed, faith, and occupation. We're Americans from every walk of life. But we're united in our belief in the Second Amendment that keeps our families safe and our country free. The NRA is fighting for vendors like myself, making sure we have a place of employment, places to employ other people, fighting for the rights of individuals to enjoy the freedoms that our forefathers enjoyed and that hopefully my kids will enjoy later on. It's a little hard sometimes for our father and son to just get out and just hang out together. Yeah, I want them to understand guns aren't what you see on TV. I've got grandkids. The country I grew up in is gone, and I want it back. In all of freedom's history, there has never been an organization quite like the National Rifle Association of America. No other people are so alert, so vigilant, so unafraid to take a stand and go out and fight for what's good and right. We, the people of the National Rifle Association, represent the very best of America's strength and of America's character. The N so what's the NRA selling? Safety. Safety. Freedom. 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 Identity membership. Identity. Patriotism. Patriotism. On that day when I searched this ad, I said, okay, well, I got to see what gun control is saying. I actually typed in gun control, and then I used some other terms. I, it kept coming back to the NRA TV ads. Uh -huh. So there really wasn't anything in 2016 on YouTube that had anything from the other side of the gun safety message. So there was no 
message going to my son or me that day that said, that countered the idea that what was good and right about America was the NRA. So if your opponent is using social media, if your opponent is changing norms and attitudes to what they believe, you got to be there. And you got to be fighting fire with fire. Um, this is one of the reasons why the NRA has been so successful, as they've been pushing for preemption laws, as they've been lobbying, litigating to defend and expand um, gun ownership and access rights. They've also been trying to change social norms. This is a construct since the 70s to say that we are a gun-loving, gun-toting culture. Um, they're trying to redefine gun owners by diversity. There's women, children, babies, people checking out guns at gun shows in these ads. It looks like a Gap ad. You can see yourself in it, right? Um, and, and so, you know, if you had a stereotypical notion of a member of an NRA being, you know, maybe a middle-aged white guy that likes to hunt, you know, it, it, they're trying to disabuse you of these stereotypes and growing their membership. So, so no matter what side of the issue you're on, but particularly if the other side is manipulating and trying to market their idea, then you've got to fight fire with fire. The other thing is all these movements that have won have done it really well. And it's because they found kind of a really fundamental emotional core value that they connected with. You know, for, for, for guns and the NRA, it's freedom, right? Second Amendment freedoms, freedom to defend your hearth and home, freedom to hunt, freedom to collect, however you want to define it. For um, tobacco, that, that truth campaign um, that you saw with Kat McGeddon is, a, is kind of a late stage millennial Gen Y next uh, t targeting the teens and tweens of today. But when truth was first starting out, a lot of the campaigns were focused on Gen X. I'm a member of Gen X. And they did a lot of research to try and understand how do you motivate a young Gen Xer at the time to change their behavior and attitudes, right? And um, Gen X was, we were rebellious. We were, you know, we gave you grunge. We didn't like authority. So the first ads were all about how do you rebel? So the body bags ad, rebel against Philip Morris. If you really want to be cool, don't let the man in the suit manipulate you. He's trying to addict you to cigarettes. The cool thing to do is not smoke. So that worked for my generation, um, by and large. And now they're on to social justice and pets and, uh, Gen Z, late stage millennials believe uh, are, are not so edgy in terms of rebellious, but they care a lot about social justice issues. So they're tapping into that psychographic of the, of the target audience. Um, what's the truth? Um, freedom to marry, the marriage equality campaign. Love. Now that was not always the central message of the LGBT uh, campaign for marriage equality. When, you, when we go back to that moment at that meeting in Jersey City, New Jersey, um, 15 years ago, sorry, it was in 2003, they said, um, we, they came up with that 10, 10, 10, 20 construct and started to mobilize state by state. But they also said, okay, we, we, we've got some people on our side, but there's a vast majority of Americans who either don't care about this issue or just aren't aware. How can we bring more people over to our side? So they did all this polling, all this trying to understand. And they started to, and they said, we, we're not trying to convince people in the LGBT community that w this is important. We, we need to convince people in the straight community. So they were pulling all these straight people and saying, okay, what, why, first of all, why do you get married? Well, I got married because I am in love with my partner. I want to be married under the eyes of God. I want to be part of my community as a married, committed couple. And then the next question was, okay, well, why do you think a gay person wants to get married? Number one answer in these polls, this was back in the early 2000s, I don't know. I never thought about it. That was the, the first answer. And then maybe, maybe because they want to be able to visit their partner in the hospital if they have AIDS. OK, like, I mean, th this is reality. So that's when the light bulb went off for the um, marriage equality crusaders. They said, we want to get married the same reason same-sex couples want to get married. We're in love. We often want to be married into the eyes of God. We want to be accepted in our community. So, so love became the centerpiece of the campaigns. When they did their social media ads, you know, when they were fighting to um, defend that marriage bill in Massachusetts, um, you know, 
there's two religions in Massachusetts, Catholicism and ice hockey. So they found um, two ice hockey moms raising a kid they adopted who happened to be like a statewide champion superstar. You know, and, and, and the ads were about these moms getting up at four in the morning, taking them to ice hockey practice at five. I'm sure you got a lot of ice hockey here up in Minnesota too. You know, celebrating after the game, like, making the, you know, putting them in the norm, right, um, rather than not the norm. And, and, and bringing couples to go meet with their legislators and, 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 and really putting love and partnership in the center of the message. And, and that really helped move that, that movement forward. Uh, for drunk driving, you know, what's the main message there? Yes, we're mad about drunk driving, but it was friendship. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. The designated driver campaign was actually conceived up in Canada, but MAD, because of its grassroots chapters and all these millions of members, had the networks to take it viral to actually say, we've been drinking at a party. I'm not going to let you drive home drunk. I'm going to take your keys. There's no policy that says you must have a designated driver. It's a social norm switch. We changed ourselves, our citizens, and people in communities, right? So, so you got to find that that message. Um, and we could talk about this a little bit more in the breakouts about how this applies to the stigmas and the, um, uh, some of the marketing and messages around the opioid addiction and other addiction problems that we face in this country. All right, the next practice is breaking from business as usual. And um, so I teach at a business school. I teach corporate responsibility. I teach nonprofit leadership classes. Um, of course, we looked at the role of business in these movements. But you know what was really interesting is the mental model that we have of movements rising up against corporate wrongdoing. Certainly, um, with the tobacco control movement, you know that, that we can get into that a little bit later. But there wasn't a lot of room to have tobacco industry at the table. Um, in the way that we're going to talk about pharma in this issue, uh, because for the reasons that the panelists spoke of, the, um, tobacco not not having you know really any redeeming health benefits and, and so forth. Um, but when you take out the context, there's other players in the corporate world that had a big impact on the tobacco control movement. In fact, it was the airline industry that instituted the first bans. Pilot stewardesses, workers on airlines were believing the science that was out, was that secondhand smoke can make you really sick and kill you. And they said, we're dying up here. So the first flights were banned in California, then nationally. Um, you know, later, after a lot of public bans and public activism, you started to see bars and restaurants, now even some casinos. So you saw businesses um, um, becoming involved, even if, you know, looking outside of the industry that might be the primary target of a movement, business plays a lot of interesting roles. Let's look at the marriage equality movement. So another way that this norm shift came about in this country is, you know, you look at uh, in the state of California as early as the 70s, marriage equality advocates were working to get uh, relationship recognition laws, getting businesses to recognize same-sex partners on their health roles, so that by the time California came for its most recent vote, you know, California voted to allow gay marriage. Then they flip-flopped and they banned it. And then they finally voted to uh, reinstate it. And in that third vote, by that point, 80% of the people working in the state of California had access to these benefits if they needed them, right? So, so the norm in California had shifted the default being that, of course, we're you know, inclusive rather than exclusive. So, so, and then when you saw the Supreme Court hearings coming um, up in 2015 on that landmark case that decided marriage equality, making it the law of the land, you know, by that point, you had hundreds of companies signing on these Friends of the Court briefings. And you know, it wasn't just the liberal coast you know, entertainment Hollywood type uh, companies. It was ConAgra, Xerox, and everything in between. Um, uh, re really realizing that it, their employees, people in their communities um, wanted this. So in this, this was a case with marriage equality. It wasn't that companies were at the forefront, but they were certainly there before uh, many of the public sector organizations. And the other thing to recognize is activists 
when you can get a company to change its policies and its view on an issue. You know, when Bank of America decides to <coughs> create benefit packages for same-sex couples, that affects 250,000 employees and all the people and families they touch, right? So you can have a big impact. Drunk driving, really interesting case. You know, here, here I think alcohol and uh, drunk driving as an issue is more akin to opioids uh, uh, use and addiction and abuse maybe than tobacco because you know we, it, as in our society since prohibition we've given alcohol a license to operate you know we we we're saying it you know with licensing regulation and a lot of oversight it's okay to have alcohols in our community as the legislator t talks about as you own a restaurant and a bar. Um, Early on, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, Candy Lightner took a very unpopular position, which was we want alcohol at the table. We, you know, I want to understand how industry, we're not against drinking per se, we are against the act of driving drunk and killing or hurting people as a result of that reckless act, right? So how do we stop the behavior, not the whole consumption of alcohol? She got a lot of pushback and they got pushback because there was a lot of groups whose families, victims, survivors, family members of victims, survivors been hurt, wanted to put it out of business, right? And I think, you know, for better or for worse, Leitner's position was that we need alcohol industry at the table because we're never gonna put it out of business, but how do we moderate it? And if you can tap into the marketing budgets and the messages, drink responsibly, um, curtail bar hours, and all the different um, uh, policy changes, then, then you have, at least you don't have a powerful counter voice against you, right? So, so in that choice, the decision to work with and through alcohol, it's not that they didn't get resistant, it's not that alcohol didn't lobby, particularly when they were trying to raise the um, blood alcohol unit level, what would qualify you as a drunk driver. They got pushback from industry and lobbyists um, at times, but overall it was very different, for instance, than the fight against tobacco, where it was a clear black and white, us versus them, kind of all or nothing kind of fight. Now, we saw four ways that um, you as movement leaders could tap into the power of business to drive your movements forward. Um, talked a little bit about policy first movers, if you can get businesses to change their policies. And we're seeing, I think we're seeing a lot more of that today. You know, even in the wake of Parkland, you saw, you know, many of the airline and the, the car rental companies, some of them dropping their NRA membership programs. You saw Walmart saying, we're not going to sell assault weapons. We're going to voluntarily raise the age for gun purchase, Dick Sporting Goods. Bank of America, uh, Truth and Advertising, our founding partner at um, Global Social Enterprise Initiative at Georgetown, they uh, said in the wake of Parkland, they're going to stop lending through their affiliates to assault weapon manufacturers. So, so if, even if you're not directly related to an issue, businesses obviously can have an impact um, on, on the issue. Second, business can be advocates, educators. They can not just fund campaigns, but you know, signing those friends of the court briefings by putting their brands and their consumer base behind an issue or cause can be very powerful. And I think we should think a lot about this one especially in the opioid issue, because you know, leaving aside pharma, right, which is implicated and involved in this issue through and through, there are so many other industries, whether it's health insurance, you know, any employer dealing with lost productivity, right? The employers are members of the community. They have employees that are impacted and their families impacted by these issues. So think about business much broader than just who's your enemy at the current point in time. Um, Product innovators, certainly there are times when there's innovations that can help advance a cause. You know, Nicorette gum helps people buy it, you know, helps people quit smoking, quit lines, um, safety uh, locks on guns, fingerprint technology for drunk driving, interlock technology, you know, lots of tech. Now, is it a silver bullet? No, right? It's not going to alone solve the problem, but it certainly can contribute um, to, to advancing a cause forward. And then last but not least, I just you know, keep in mind that in our day and age, while businesses and companies and industries can help advance your cause, of course, there are time when you know, they need to be exposed for wrongdoing. And um, what's, what's changed in our lifetimes is how exposed they are. 
and the power of the of the one, right? Because of internet, because of social media, you know, this all started when uh, with the advent of video cameras in the 80s and 90s, Greenpeace volunteers starting to commandeer whaling ships and going out and putting themselves between the harpoon and the whale that was getting shot, right? And then you had Earth Firsters climbing to the top of canopy of trees protecting the environment. And, and, and then you have Greenpeace activists smoke diving off, uh, skydiving off of smokestacks, right, to, you know, uh, protest against pollution. So, so you have these extreme actions, and then, of course, with the immediacy of things going viral uh, in a nanosecond, one individual or group can take on a very powerful global industry. So um, that is a sword that cuts both ways. Um, it's a dynamic that is very different than the movements that happened before this moment of networked uh, technology. All right, so we've got two other kind of factors, and then we're going to, I think we're going to break for lunch. And uh, we're do some questions first. Oh, Q&A, okay. More flexibility. We're going to be, continue to be flexible and hopefully not too hungry, because right. we are going to eat at some point, too. Um, these two kind of go hand in hand. We looked at how winning movements and struggling movements reckon with what we call adversarial allies. Every movement has it. Whether you're on the winning side, you know, tobacco control took decades. It took steps forward and huge steps back. That first master settlement agreement imploded uh, when the attorneys generals were suing on behalf of the states that were drowning in Medicaid costs uh, as a result of disease and death related to smoking and tobacco use. So, you know, they, that, that blew apart in part because the tobacco control movement was so riddled with dissension and strife. You know, you had a camp that just wanted to put tobacco out of business, and you had the non-smokers rights groups, and then you had the more moderate groups like the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids that were saying, we're never going to put tobacco out of business, so how do, we, um, how do we just at least get them to stop marketing to kids, get Joe Camel out of the schools and out of the uh, uh, things that young people see, and um, get rid of the vending where you don't have to check IDs, you know, and, you know, there's kind of four Ps, place, uh, purchasing, uh, promotion, and, 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 and use the marketing tactics to curtail um, tobacco access and use. Um, all of the movements that we studied had a lot of dissension and conflict, both on policy approaches and personalities and fighting over money, media, who gets to testify before Congress? Who gets to testify before the legislator? All that stuff happened. The only thing I can tell you is that the winning movements somehow figured out to get maybe if not all, maybe 80% of their members and constituencies moving in a general direction. One of the beauties of that 10, 10, 10, 20 construct, you know, going back to that marriage equality story, one thing that solved for them was they had a huge adversarial allies problem in the gay community. One of the problems we all have in any movement we're involved with is you tend to see the enemy as a monolithic one, when in fact it's very. So what was going on in the LGBT movement in the early 2000s was they're having huge fights at these meetings because a third maybe of the, of the advocates really wanted full marriage. They said, we want to go for marriage. We think this is the right thing to do. But a big camp, maybe a whole third, said, we don't want anything to do with traditional straight marriage. It's too traditional. We're queer. We're proud. We don't want to be a part of the mainstream. Okay? And then you had a third who said, we don't really care either way. We just want to be able to visit our partner when they're sick. We want to be on our health bed. We want to take care of our families. Right? So you had all of this fighting going on. And the beauty of the 10, 10, 10, 20 was that then they said, great. If, if all you want to do is get discriminatory laws off the books, you know, in the heartland off the coast, there, a lot of the derision was, well, gay marriage is just a white men on the coast with money problem. The rest of us are getting bashed, can't get jobs, can't get housing, and are discriminated against, right? And it's not about marriage. It's about very basic Maslow hierarchy needs. So take the 20 states where those needs are being denied and work on that. And then go to New York and work on your liberal marriage, right? Like, it, it, it kind of worked for the whole movement because it allowed everybody, again, to take a step forward, even if they didn't all agree on the one policy solution. So we'll look at how some of those did this. And they, the, the last practice is around being leaderful and um, how the movements were led. So if you look at 
movement leadership um, spectrum, you can kind of make gross generalizations. And some movements, on the one hand, could be described as leaderless, right? Like, remember Occupy Wall Street, the 99%? So what happened with Occupy Wall Street? There are a lot of protests. They had a total flat leadership structure. There was no governing structure. Everybody was equal. Everybody had an equal vote. So they had, you know, 21 different proposals and positions that they took, and uh, you know, and the whole thing got a lot of attention. That kind of fizzled. Now, on the other extreme, you can have leader to, or movements that are too leader-led, too top-down, national groups dictating policy, taking all the money, taking all the media spots, not pushing it out to the state and local chapters, affiliates, coalitions where the real work gets done. So what you want to do is find this kind of balance in the middle, leader full, where you're pushing power and authority out to the grassroots, but you have a nationally coordinated strategy letting people work in the same general direction in harmony, but not all following the same tune, like I talked about with marriage equality, right? So each of these groups had these leaderful leaders at the grass tops with with um, tobacco control, you had campaign for tobacco-free kids. Again, it was a consortium of all these big health voluntaries helping pull together, providing assistance to the state and local coalitions through technical assistance and such, acting more like a conductor of an orchestra than a military commander or a CEO of a company. Um, same thing for Freedom to Marry. You had Freedom to Marry acting like a central campaign um, helping set general direction, but then working with other groups to implement. And then um, in some cases, like with the drunk driving, you had one organization like Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but because the structure of that big membership organization was decentralized chapters, it in effect acted like um, a leaderful movement. So we've talked about all these practices. We're going to do some Q&A, but let me just leave you with these kind of three essential truths that stuck with me after I finished this research um, over three or four years. One is, I think this is really important for those of us that care about opioids and addiction. Change is possible. Right? There were dark moments in all these movements, and yet they were able to prevail. Um, and change is nonpartisan. You know, when I think about the changes that we've experienced in our lifetimes, right? We've, we've pretty much abandoned smoking, right? LGBT marriage is the law of the land. And we've massively expanded gun rights, ownership, and access all in the last couple decades, right? So if you're a Tea Partier and a conservative and a Trumper, you've won some. And if you're a liberal, a progressive, a Democrat, on the other hand, you've won some. So we know that you know, no party has a lock on change, or faith, for that matter. Right? If God was on the side of any one of these issues, um, uh, there clearly wasn't, you know, if many gods were involved, there wasn't consensus. Right? Um, <laughs> so it, it was. And then the last thing well, I'll say is that change is deliberate. We know that if it's not because of the party that you're part of or the faith that you draw from that gives you um, the ability to be successful. We know it's because of the way these movements are lead, led and organized. And it's those practices, those deliberate strategies that leaders figured out and pushed forward that is the reason why we have this incredible, almost dizzying array of policy outcomes that we all live with today. Um, but these leaders, many of them, by and large, were everyday leaders. They there was nothing in Candy Leitner's background, a single mom, a real estate agent, that said that she'd go on to cut drunk driving rates in half by creating MAD. And yet here we are, right? So in this room, you have the power to build and lead these movements and create the change that needs to happen here in Minnesota and also in this country. And I look forward to the Q&A to talk about how you're going to do that. Thank you. Thank you.